I'm passing the buck to you, man. You passing the buck. You start this thing and let God be with us as we talk through spiritual warfare because it makes me nervous. Is it, are you you're nervous right now? It makes me a little. You may be under attack. Uh, oh my goodness! <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> you know, spiritual warfare is. It's, it's real. It is real. It's, it's absolutely real. Um, there, I say this a lot of times when I preach. There is a cosmic battle going on in the world for the human soul. Good morning and welcome home to Life Point. My name is Graham and I get to serve here. Our mission as a church is to bring glory to God and love as many people to Jesus as we can before we die, period. If you're new to Life Point, a very special welcome home to you. We're about to have an hour long service, including worship and a message in our series seven, Killing the Killers. If you need anything, we have hosts with yellow name tags at every door. Be sure to follow us on social media, download our mobile app and check out our website at lifepointlevenon.com. Have a fantastic Sunday. How you guys doing this morning? Why don't you guys go ahead and stand, we'll get started. God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. God, we know that you have something special prepared for this message. God, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whoa, 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 whoa. Was it for nothing that you shed your blood? So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone. I won't be shackled to the way I was. Oh, I'm gonna live like my chains are gone.
Good morning. Look at this beautiful day that we have today. You may be seated. My name is Pam, and I serve in the youth. I love it. They call me Miss Pam. But um, I just want to give you um, a little information today. Um, you can sign up to do your testimony, which is really awesome. You have, I'm sure you have a story, so sign up. That's October 19th. And men, save the date on October 26th. Um, there's a paintball event for you guys, which is going to be totally awesome. Um, we'll have a 2nd Street block party down on 2nd Street. Just a time for you to go and love on some people in the community and have a really good time and fellowship. You may stand. Back to worship. So I could 
We give you glory and honor and praise this morning for who you are, what you've done, what you will do, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for never leaving us, never forsaking us, Lord, and for meeting us right where we are, Lord. Only you can love us like that, Lord. We thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Will you 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you now. Father, we're asking for you to come and to meet us here again. Father, we love you today. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. My name is Kyle Rhodes. I get to serve as a life group leader down in the children's room also. Um, I get to work with little kids. I get to work with junior high kids out at Jolie Barber, coach football and stuff. It's a lot of fun. So sports is part of my life. Um, it's a big part of my life. It's who I've always been. It's all what I've always done. So there's a motivational speaker that I was listening to one night, late at night, uh, as I was scrolling through Facebook. His name's Eric Thomas. They call him E.T. When I first saw E.T., I was thinking of the movie, you know. And uh, he's an African-American, but he's a great motivational speaker, Christian guy. And uh, he was talking to a group of football players, and he's asking them, the first question he asked them was, how many of you are going back to the hood to live with, to go see your boys in the hood? I was like, okay, where's this going? And a lot of guys raised their hand. And then he asked them, why are you going back to a life that somebody has brought you out of? And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this is, this is getting pretty deep. And then he began to talk on how they have an opportunity that most of them were African-American young men didn't have like their family had had. Well, most of us as Christians don't have the opportunities that we have today. There's so many things out there to help us, but the biggest problem that I see and that I face myself is I won't go ask. I won't go seek because I think I can take care of it myself. And uh, September 30th is the day in history that I'll hate for the rest of my life things happen and you think, oh, I can take care of it. Well, when it happens, you just don't know. So if tithing and offering is something that you're not for sure about, that's beaten and dwelling in your heart, come talk to me. I'll talk to you about it. Go find somebody else. Talk to them. Because I want to encourage you to go step out and talk to somebody about it. Because it's not, it's not easy. It's hard. You're like, how am I going to make this work? But when you're in the game that God has called you to play in, He will take care of you. He will. You're thinking, well, how will that happen? I don't know. But I can honestly say that God will take care of you. Just in the last two weeks, God's answered some major prayers in our family that's unexplainable. If you're in that with tithing, come speak with me. Speak to somebody. Go seek somebody out because we're not meant to do life alone. Let us pray. Lord, as we use these tithes and offerings this morning, I pray that they go to use and to be for your glory and for the church and for those that that need it and uh, Father we just ask that you would bless us today we ask that you would be with Kelly as he brings forth his sermon Father we love you and we want to give you all the praise and glory in your precious name we pray Amen
Well, hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? All right. Well, I hope that everyone is doing as great as I am. Who is glad that fall is finally here? Anybody? Come on. Yes. That means, that means the mosquitoes and the frost that came, the, the mosquitoes, the ticks, the chiggers are going to take a vacation. Praise the Lord. Um, <laughs> I love that falls here. I, I, I don't really care much for pumpkin spice, though. Sorry for all of you that do. It, it's, it's, it's an okay flavoring, but someone put it in my apple cider, and that was awful. Um, anyway. Well, hey, guys, last week I was not able to be here with you. I was with uh, some very dear friends, Eddie and Karen Jones, up at CLC Christian Life Center in Rolla. Um, you may remember them. They came and spoke here for us before, too, and they asked me to come up last week. So I just want to say thank you for letting me go and uh, spend a Sunday with them at just teaching their church and, and just kind of trying to w- work with, uh, actually, they're a sister church of ours. We have partnered in missions in Haiti. We have partnered, in fact, just last month in September, uh, your uh, tithe money went to help support the training and encouraging of about 90 or so pastors down in Mexico um, that, that really don't have a lot. And so I I want you to know when you give, it makes a difference, not only locally, but we have an international impact as a church. And so can we just celebrate the work that God does in the life of our church? And, and while we're celebrating, didn't John do a great job last week? Let's give one up for John Brake. This is, this is literally how this happened. We're, we're talking about, you know, the different topics within the seven deadly sins that we can cover. And I thought, all right, that one is the hardest one. John, why don't you take it? And he said, sure, I'll take it. I like that attitude. It's awesome. But he did a great job. We are going to continue today in that series, week two of seven killing the killers. We're looking at these seven deadly sins. Now, this idea of seven deadly sins is not new by any means whatsoever. This is something that's been around for a very long time in the history of the church. In fact, the the idea of the seven deadly sins comes from a guy named Evagrius of Pontus. He was a Greek monastic theologian uh, back in the early 300s, and he was trying to come up with a way to talk about the struggles that we all have as human beings with sin. Now, the, the, the culture that he was speaking to and teaching was largely illiterate, and so he needed something that was easy for them to understand that they could, that they could receive audibly but that was also connected deeply to Scripture, but while still simple, was able to address the more complex issues and questions that arise in life and in the study of Scripture and theology. And so what he put together is something that he called then the eight offenses and wicked human passions, and they were, um, in order of increasing seriousness, gluttony, lust, avarice or greed, uh, sadness, Anger, acidia, which is mental or spiritual sloth or apathy, vainglory, which is inordinate pride in yourself or your accomplishments, and vanity and pride. So you look at all these things together and, and you begin to see that hey, so there's a lot of these that can, can kind of blend together. And, and over the years, about, for about 300 years, his teaching stood, but eventually Gregory the Great came in. He was one of the first uh, major leaders uh, in, the, in the Roman church, so really the first pope. He put that together. And this was before there was a division within the church. Martin Luther didn't come around for another, uh, I think, 1,300 years um, or 1,200 years. And so when we see all these different things that, are, that happen in the life of the church, this is one of the first places where all the Christians came together and said, okay, we, we, we believe these are issues. And so how are we going to teach on them? And, and then Dante wrote his poem called The Inferno, and the seven deadly sins uh, became manifest. And they are, of course, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, anger, envy, and Pride. Now, the order in which they have been taught has changed through the centuries, but the content remains the same. The reality is these are human issues, that these issues, as they present themselves, are not new. These issues, as they present themselves, um, are not unique. They are issues that will probably be around as long as we're around. These are issues that people will always in some way struggle with and have an understanding of, at least understanding of the temptation that gets us there. But this is not just part of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of Christian 
theology. This is actually part of our social fabric as well. Uh, how many of you guys were here for our uh, movie in the park, our, our outreach? I actually had it inside. Anybody here for that? It was, it was a movie. We showed the movie Shazam. Uh, Shazam was a blockbuster, um, big budget motion picture movie. We edited it down for the family and we watched it. And within Shazam, uh, he actually also has the seven deadly sins. This picture here is from the 1950s uh, when Shazam was being uh, created. And it shows that the, the big enemy of Shazam was the seven deadly sins of man. And these things are represented here in comic book form. So this is not only something that exists within our church world, within the life of faith. This is absolutely an issue that exists in all of our culture um, because we've all felt these temptations. We've all um, had some sort of pull in these areas which is exactly what makes them so deadly. Some of us occasionally have a tendency to see where other people have fallen. And because they've fallen there, we kind of think to ourselves, well, I don't have that issue. That's not a weakness of mine. I'm strong enough. I don't really have to struggle there. That's, that's not a, a huge issue for me. And in that moment of delusion, we're tempted to cross a line, to partake in the prohibited, Sometimes, if only to show how strong we truly are, because we are attracted to what we are told not to pursue. And we know that this is true, and particularly if you've ever raised a kid, you know that if you tell a child no, there's something about that very act of telling them no that kind of draws them closer to that prohibited behavior, right? You say things like, don't eat crayons, <laughs> and they do. <laughs> you say things like, don't ride the cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a time in, uh, whenever my daughter Reese was younger, and we said, Reese, don't play with the whiteout. And I have this picture as a perfect memory of that moment. I call this picture regret. <laughs> she wasn't exactly sure if the white stuff would come off of her arms or not. <laughs> so she just kept putting it on there. But we, we have these issues in life, and we can't be too angry at kids whenever they, when they, when they fail after they've been told no, because... All seven deadly sins exist because we, as adults, have found ways to get around the no. We've found ways to justify stepping into that type of behavior. We know the no, and in fact, the very first one could not be more clear. It comes to us in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from the tree, or to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And so you have freedom to eat from whatever you want. Eat anything. Eat all of it. Just don't eat that one. Don't eat from that tree. God directed them to their freedom before he warned them for the potential bondage. I like to point that out for a reason because sometimes we have the broken understanding of who God is and what he's about. See, God is always for our good. Amen? God is always for our good. We, we sing a song around here sometimes called Good, Good Father. That's exactly what kind of father our God is. He is always for our good. He is always guiding us and leading us into our best, no question. That is who God is. A lot of people think that God just wants to keep us away from the fun stuff, that God wants to keep us away from the good stuff. But the truth is what God really wants for you is to walk in the freedom, is to walk in the abundance of the life that Jesus came to give us. That's what God wants for us. And so he points us in the direction of the good things first and says, have all of this, just don't eat that. I can eat anything I want, but I can't eat that. Any meatloaf fans? There's a few, there's a few. All right, good. I had to throw that in there. We do that, though. We, we get this thing in our minds that, 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 that God and, and the Bible and church and church people, that it's all about saying no to things all the time. And, and that's a, a sort of faith. That's what a religion comes about. It becomes about saying no and not doing things. But God is saying, I want you to experience life and living life that God wants you to is really about saying the right yes than saying all the right no's. God wants us to continue to say yes to the life that he's calling us to. But there's a reality about no that 
that it's hard for us to take our eyes off of it. Mark Twain said this, there's a charm about the forbidden that makes it unspeakably desirable. We want it because we're told we can't have it. And this attitude is connected to our most base desires. It is this childish immaturity that exists within us that has been around since time immemorial. And it's an issue. The command was to enjoy what he declared to be perfect, and it was clear, just as the consequences of what would happen if they violated command were also clear. That no is so attractive, and here's what happened. Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Did you catch that? Now, John rightfully pointed out to us last week, which was brilliant, that that was the sin of sloth, the sin of Adam's inaction that allowed that first sin to take place. That's the reason why we're in this mess today. But that actually wasn't the first sin. That actually wasn't the first transgression. Gluttony was the first transgression. Look at the verse. The first thing she saw was that the tree was good for food. Before she smelt how wonderful the the blossoms smelled, before she felt the texture of the fruit in her hand, before she felt or tasted the the juice and had the, the juices running down the side of her mouth, before any of that happened, she saw that the fruit was good for food. She thought and she thought, man, I want to eat that thing. She was literally surrounded by food. Surrounded by food in the perfect garden. So it was perfect food in the perfect garden. No sin or imperfection had entered into the earth at all. Not only was she surrounded by perfect food, she was surrounded by, by a, 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 just a huge selection. So it's not like she had been eating blueberries for six years. She was surrounded by a veritable cornucopia of good, healthy, wonderful produce that she could eat as much as she wanted, clearly indicated by God, but she had to have what she knew she probably shouldn't. And isn't that how it starts? We've eaten our fill. You've, you've been to the buffet. You've eaten your fill. You're starting to feel pretty good. Then you kind of look over, and there's something that you missed on the first time around. There's, there's something there that, hmm, I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to anyway. You were at Thanksgiving dinner, and, and you had noticed that, that everything was wonderful and it was good, and then, and then here's the pumpkin pie. And you probably shouldn't, but you're going to anyway. And that's how it often starts. Is we, we know we probably shouldn't, but then we do. Instead of a cookie, we have five cookies. Instead of a piece of pie, we have half the pie. We do that. It's, it's, it's not, maybe not everybody, but it's something that is part of, it's part of our life. It's part of our culture in America. When we think about gluttony, overindulgence is what we think of, but it's really deeper than that. There's another theologian actually in the 1300s. His name was Thomas Aquinas. He is still and, re- and will likely remain one of the greatest and most influential theologians in the history of the Christian church. Thomas Aquinas wrote a work called Summa Theologica, and basically what he did, you can buy it for like 99 cents on Kindle right now if you're interested, but basically what he did was he tried to work to come up with all these issues to to, to kind of sum up, this is the summation of what we understand about God. This is how we understand who God is so we can live the lives that God wants us to live. And so he writes this down, it's called Summa Theologica, and in it he has an entire dissertation about gluttony. And he comes up with not one, but five expressions of the ways that we commit gluttony. Here's a few, and forgive me on my Latin pronunciations. Here's the first one. It's laute. Not latte, that's what you get at Starbucks. This is laute. And it is exclusively eating food that is too luxurious exotic or costly. Now, most of the time we hear that and we think, okay, this is spending way too much money on food. This is just blowing your budget on food. Yes, kind of, but it's also 
that person who refuses to eat leftovers because, yeah. Like, I'm not going to eat leftovers because I just don't eat leftovers. You see, the attitude that supports that is, is really an attitude that they can't have everywhere else in the world. They can't. In fact, I, I'll never forget, I was in uh, Ethiopia with Brad and Stacy uh, with their, the work they do over there. Um, and uh, we saw all these kids come in, and they were eating just, just plain old beans and rice. And they ate their full. And then at the end, I thought they were creating a slot bucket. They were, they were putting their, their food back from their plate back into this big bucket. And they, when, when they kind of filled that back up, they took it out. And they fed it to the children in the street that didn't have the opportunity to eat. What we would throw in the trash, they were using to bring in, and, and the kids were very happy to come in and get that. You see, for us, we're not going to eat leftovers. For them, they're thrilled to get a leftover. Leftovers not an option because they flat out don't have enough. And so this... This idea, this laute eating, exclusively eating food that's too luxurious, exotic, or costly, you might think, hey, I, I don't, that's not me. Is it? Could be. Here's the next one. It's called studios. Eating food that is excessive in quality, too daintily or too elaborately prepared. It goes along with laute because a lot of times this food is very expensive, but, but that's not, the, the expense is not the thing here. This, this food is, is works of art. How many of you guys like to watch the Food Channel? Anybody watch Food Network? You've, you've seen those works of food? You know, that cake that could double as like a, a UFO or a spaceship or something, you know? It doesn't look like a cake. It looks like, it looks like a sculpture. Um, there's some people that want to eat like that all the time. Everything is just too daily prepared, and it's, and it's, it's really the, the, the function of the food is, is to be artwork. But God did not ever intend food to be pleasing to our eye. He intended to be fuel for our bodies. And so whenever we take part in those kind of things exclusively, again, it kind of distorts the purpose of the food that God's given us. Now, let's just be clear. It's not that you can't take your wife out for a nice meal. It's not that you can't have expensive food. It's not that you can't even have that artsy kind of food if you're one of those kind of people, if you're a foodie. God's not saying those things are prohibited. It's saying, he's saying that it's, it's if you only enjoy these finer things, only enjoy these exclusive things, that it's wasteful and foolish to live like that. The next one is called nimus, which is eating food that is excessive in quality. It's too much. This is pretty familiar to us. This is the overeating aspect. This is the overconsumption aspect of, of gluttony that we're pretty familiar with, that we typically think of. But there's also this, which is preaporere, which means eating hastily, too soon or at an inappropriate time. How many of you guys ever eat in your car? Anybody? Aquinas would say, you're a glutton. Anybody like to have a midnight snack? Aquinas would say, if this is your regular practice, then you are committing this type of gluttony. Because there's something about the meal that is only, not only supposed to be edifying to our bodies while we eat it, but there's, there's actually a, a restful aspect of it that we're supposed to take part of and enjoy. Um, but of the five, the next one, the last one is the worst. It's called our denter, and it's eating greedily. And what this is, is it speaks not only to overeating, but it has a, an edge to something more. It is seen as by far the worst form of gluttony, and it, it depicts an extreme attachment to the pleasure of gluttony. This crosses a line to more of just than just enjoying food. It crosses a line into now I almost worship food. I turn to food for comfort. I turn to food to help me when I'm having uh, a uh, hard time. And that is something that, that crosses a line. See, gluttony for us is hard. It's, 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 it's not necessarily a sin that you can see because when you look back at these five descriptions, I would say almost all of us have had a struggle or could maybe have a struggle right now with at least one of those. We realize that gluttony is kind of more than we thought. So you can be skinny and be a glutton. You can be overweight and not be a glutton. There's serious medical issues that would cause someone to look as if they may be a glutton, but they have some hormonal, hormonal imbalances in their body. 
there's some issues that people have where they ingest so much food, then they have to do things that are injurious to the body to get rid of that food so they don't look like they have ingested so much food. We call those eating disorders, and they are just as damaging, and they are just as gluttonous as anything else. But if we're going to be honest and look deeply at this issue, we have to look more than just our waistline. Gluttony isn't just about overeating food. The term actually represents any kind of overindulgence or overconsumption on a regular basis. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's just waste. Gluttony is a form of selfishness. See, in ancient Christianity, it was an excessive desire for food, which caused food to be withheld from those who needed it most. That's why when we read scripture, there's numerous scriptures against gluttony. One of the things they accused Jesus of was not only being a drunkard, but also being a glutton, someone who's selfish. See, in that time, the fact of people starving to death was a very real issue in every community. Today, we have it differently. We have modern means of, of agricultural food production. We grow more food than we eat every year in the United States. We have modern means of preservation. And so after we grow it, we can can it. We can refrigerate it, we can freeze it, we can do all those kind of things that they didn't have access to back then. We have modern means of transportation. You can literally cut something in a field, you can harvest it, and you can take it to the other end of the earth in just a couple days. We have those abilities now. And so the world we live in now is, is different. In fact, we're on the other side of things. We, we still have issues with hunger, we still have issues with people not having enough food, but the bigger issue that we have now is that we are consuming too much. But gluttony, just because our relationship with food has changed somewhat, remains an issue. Because gluttony is also associated with substance abuse, not just the abuse of food. This is what Justin Kuntz, who writes for um, a recovery center in Florida, he writes this. Were we not incredibly gluttonous in our substance abuse? Did we not drink every drop and clear out every bag of drugs as if something inside of us required us to do so? And if we continue with our excessive behaviors, we will soon find we become impossible to satisfy. And this gets to the heart of why gluttony is a real issue for so many. Because gluttony is an expression of idolatry. That our denter type of gluttony is very easy to see, that, that we turn to it. It's, it's something that begins to control us. Food becomes the thing that we think about at all times. This is true of the person who thinks about how much they can consume, as well as the person who thinks about how much that they need to control from coming into their body. Food dominates your thoughts. Idolatry is a serious issue in the life of any believer. So it takes an otherwise minor character flaw and reveals it to be something much deeper, something much more dangerous. And with this particular advice, it's pretty hard to see, even if you're overweight, because of this one issue. See, God created food to sustain our bodies and to be enjoyed. It's easier for us, right, when we know that sin is painful and we feel that pain immediately, right? Like, very few people have a normal habit of smashing their thumb with a hammer. Why? Because you have an immediate response that says, this is not a good thing. Right? And that's the danger of sin. We enjoy it so much. The Bible even says sin is pleasurable for a season. Whoever tells you that sin's no fun just <laughs> doesn't know what they're talking about because typically it is. In fact, the old theologians tell us that most sin is a corruption of a good thing that God has given us. Gluttony is right there with it. Because when God created our food, he created it to be good. God created tomato, and he made it to be good. Amen. I can attest to that. I love tomatoes. When God created sugar, he created it to taste good. He created it to be attractive and appealing to us. It should taste good. But it's also why so many have a difficult issue with this topic. Gregor the Great said, since in eating, pleasure and necessity go together, we fail to discern between the call of necessity and the seduction of pleasure. He says there's a line that's necessary, but then we cross it. The reality is we have to eat. If we don't eat, we don't live. We don't get to do photosynthesis. If I stay out longer in the sun, I don't get more injury. I, I, I turn red. We have to consume things just so we can live. Now, Aquinas in Summa Theologica 
in his dissertation actually deals with, with why this is such an issue. Um, we might not think of it as much today, but back in the early days of Christianity, they were trying to understand, trying to help people understand doctrine and, and to teach them these things. And they expounded on these seven deadly sins. And, and gluttony was actually one that they debated. Like the brightest minds in theology would get together and they would write these papers and they would send them out. And it wasn't as quick as it is today, but they would they would have these discussions, they would have these teachings, they would have these debates, and gluttony was one of those things that was debated hotly. And, and in fact, it took a long time for them to decide that it was actually, in fact, a sin. Here's the first objection. It would seem that gluttony is not a sin, for our Lord said, Matthew 5, 11, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Gluttony regards food, which goes into a man. And therefore, since sin defiles a man, it seems that gluttony is not a sin. That was their line of thinking. But really what Jesus was talking about in this particular scripture, in this particular passage, was not about gluttony. It was about the Pharisees' fanatical adherence to a law to make them pure. But they didn't have the relationship with God. See, we can only get pure through a relationship with Jesus. And so they had this kind of broken understanding of what that scripture was. And so another argument rose up against gluttony being sin, and that is simply this, that we cannot avoid eating. We have to eat to live, and no man sins in what he can't avoid. Augustine himself, who's another powerful theologian, says, who is it, Lord, that does not eat a little more than is necessary? Like if, if you're supposed to have a 2,000 calorie diet, is, is that the plot line? If you eat 2,001, have you now crossed it? And how do we know when we've crossed that line? How, how do we tell when we've crossed that line? He says, it's hard for us to understand and discern exactly when we have crossed that line. And so because we have this natural inclination to eat, and it's a natural and necessary appetite, gluttony can't be considered a sin. The, the debate continued. The brightest minds in the church argued over these things and debated these things. The church dissected the topic. And finally, in the third movement, the third objection, they started to, what I think made some, some good traction, as they looked at what's called the first movement. Now, the first movement of any sin is thought to be the cause of the sin. Jesus spoke to this when he talked about the dangers of anger because anger leads to murder. He talked about the danger of lusting of our girl because that turns to adultery. Jesus was very clear. The apostle uh, James also very clear that the behaviors that we exhibit in life that become out and out sin don't just start as those behaviors, that there's actually a process within our minds where this, this thought gives birth to an, a desire, gives birth to an action, gives birth to a sin. And so what is that first movement? What is that first thing that happens? And so they, they brought it back to this. It's, it's this idea that where does this desire to eat food come from? Well, it's, it's tied to this inescapable reality of, of, of getting hungry and being thirsty because if you don't eat and if you don't drink, you do eventually die. And so they, they started with this, but, but here's where the issue comes in. The first movement in taking a sin is, is not, or taking food in is not a sin. Or else hunger and thirst would be sinful, and they certainly are not. But this is where the light begins to turn on. Because as much as we might like to think it does, what I've discovered, what all kinds of people have discovered, is that hunger and thirst are not what drives any form of gluttony. So what does drive gluttony? It's the desire to be full. Now, that might sound counterintuitive, but think about it. When I say full, I, I don't mean that full like you get after Thanksgiving dinner. We know what that feels like. I, I mean full like this. You spent the night with your friends. You hadn't seen them for years, and you laughed, and you laughed, and you laughed. You cried. You enjoyed that time so much. It was full of memories. You are so thankful that you had it. You will always remember that night. And when you were done, you looked over at your spouse. You said, my heart is so full. You had a time in worship when you felt like God was right there in your pew, that your God was wrapping you in his arms, and you could just feel the power and presence of God in your body in such a way I was just filled with the power of God. This idea of being full is not something that's foreign to us. This idea of being full 
Man, that's the best way we can describe the best moments of our life. It means that we're satisfied. It means that our needs are met. There's an aspect of safety that's wrapped up in that feeling. But just as important as what we feel in those moments is also what we don't feel. See, the desire to be full comes from too much experience feeling empty. We know what it's like to feel full when we eat because there's an internal pressure that we can point to. There's empty plates that we can point to and like, oh yeah, I did eat that. There's something that points us in that direction that assures us that we are full. We feel the effects of the sugar or caffeine or whatever it is that we just ingested. And that feels good. And that's part of God's design for us. It's part of how he's wired us. It's, it's good to feel full, but when we feel empty, we feel vulnerable, like we're missing something integral to our happiness. And sometimes that empty feeling is so powerful that it, that it crushes in on us. See, when we're miserable, it's easy to overeat, especially carbohydrates, especially sugar. Within 45 minutes, those chemicals transform into serotonin, which is the feel-good uh, neurotransmitter in our brains. And so we literally begin to feel good very quickly. So much so that when we're going through difficult times, our bodies literally crave and call out for carbs. They call out for sugar. It's hard to say no when our bodies and our brains are screaming yes. See, food fills. Alcohol drowns. A drug mask, that's all the same thing. And we do it, and for a short time, we do feel better, or at least we think we feel better. But food, like any other drug, has the power to make us feel good. That's why we call it comfort food. It fills us, it fills us, and we feel it. And it feels better than feeling empty. It feels better than dealing with with our feelings. See, good food is supposed to be enjoyable for us, but things cross a line when that fulfillment comes from the food rather than the one who provides it. See, every good and perfect gift comes from God. All of our food is a gift that he provides us. He gives us the ability to grow it. He gives us the ability to produce it. It's a wonderful thing. If you doubt that, try growing plants in the dark. It's, it's all from him. It's a gift. Ed Young said that every time God introduces a good and perfect gift, Satan introduces a counterfeit. That good and perfect gift gets corrupted. There's something about it that gets twisted and turned around. And it's no longer good. Jim Gaffigan a comedian has made a fortune talking about this, and he makes a point. He says, we eat our feelings, and they are delicious. But it's easier to eat and feel full, to have that serotonin kicking around than it is to deal with the pain of our emotions. Because if we can feel good, then we're good, right? But is that true? Food provides a counterfeit for the validation that we need. So what do we do? The answer is multifaceted. According to centuries of teaching, the answer to gluttony is temperance. But temperance is much more than just saying no. Temperance is much more than just not doing. Temperance is, is more powerfully and closely tied to, to the, the spiritual gift of self-control that God gives us. It's it's not just about saying no to the wrong things. It's about saying yes to the right things. Remember the beginning, Genesis 2.16, you are free to eat from any fruit in the tree of the garden. God starts by pointing us to the good things that he made us for, that he made for us. He points us to things that we should pursue rather than just telling us what not to do. God is more concerned that we say yes to the right things than he is that we say no to the wrong things. And here's why. When you say yes to the right stuff, the wrong becomes unappealing. In May, I uh, decided that it was finally time for me to start dealing with some of my issues in this area. 
Um, I have always struggled with my weight. Um, there was a time when I was in college when I was working out all the time that it wasn't an issue. But whenever I was a little boy, all the jeans we bought were Huskies. Just putting it out there. And so this has been an issue for me for all of my life. Some things uh, just kind of happened. God brought some things to my attention, and he convicted me more strongly. I had felt some conviction before, but it wasn't really powerful. But this last spring, God really brought it to my attention that, that I really need to do something about my own sugar intake, about the way I use sugar, the way I use food to deal with my stress and my problems. See, when I found myself stressed, I would stop and get an ice cream cone. I'd, I'd stop and grab a blizzard. Um, I'd find myself sitting down not having a cookie, but I would sit down with a package of cookies, a bowl of ice cream. Not once a week, not a couple times a month, every day, multiple times a day. The more stress, the more sugar. And God convicted me that this is an issue. See, if I did the same thing with alcohol, you would say I had a problem. If I did the same thing with drugs, I would have a record. God shined a light, and my eyes were open. I knew that I needed to make a change. So in May, I began to take my first steps to overcome sugar addiction. But I didn't want this to be about weight loss. See, the last thing that I need is to have vanity wrapped in with this. And so I've not stood around at or even looked at a scale because I don't want this to be about how much pounds I've lost or how many, how many inches I have shrank or anything at all. I want this to be about gaining char character. I want this to be about, about developing stronger self-control. I want this to be about leaning into my Lord instead of into this substance. And so I started taking some really serious steps and some really serious strides to break that. My reward has been an even closer walk with God. Yes, I've lost weight. I have no idea how much. I don't care. That's not the point of this. The biggest benefit is that my prayer life has been fuller. My connection with God has been deeper. Yes, my physical body is changing, and thank you for noticing, but that's really not the point. I can tell you that I've, I've always had scripture and prayer as part of my regular routine and daily habit. I've just leaned into them more powerfully and more deeply, and they have helped me overcome these issues. They've, it's been powerful, um, and it's changed the way I relate to sugar as well. When you say yes to the good things, it makes the wrong things unappealing. Last week, and I don't know who made this, but I want you to know I'm about to say something. It's not meant to be offensive to you. If you baked this apple, apple bread, it was wonderful. It's powerful, but I did not know um, that it had frosting on it. Bridget brought this home from the bazaar, and I thought, I'm just going to have a little piece of that. And so I took a piece, and I started from the bottom, and I was eating that. I don't know why. I think it's more moist or something. I don't know. Just do that. And um, all of a sudden, I got the frosting part in my mouth. It was just a big caramel hunk of sugar. Now, in the past, I would have savored that. I mean, every morsel. I would have made the sugar experience last for as long as I possibly could. You can ask Bridget, when we would sit down for a meal, I would inhale the meal, but the dessert I could make last for an hour. Just every little bite. Dainty. And just and stretch it out and enjoy that. Last week, when that sugar hit my mouth, it was as if I found a hair because I tried to spit it out. In fact, Rhett laughed at me as I'm sitting in my chair. <laughs> Something changed within me. Not being on sugar since May changed the way my, my mouth interacts with food. It changed the way I think about food. It, it, just, it just changed some things. That little dab of frosting that just a few months ago I would have indulged in. I would have started there and I would have it just enjoyed every bit of it, savored every molecule. Now I'm spitting it out. Why? Because when you start saying yes to the right stuff, the wrong stuff becomes unappealing. In the last five months, I haven't, haven't had hardly any kind of sugar at all. I've spent more time in prayer. I've spent more time leaning into God's word. I've spent more time building deeper relationships, pursuing the good things that God has pointed me to. I have been exercising self-control, but I still have a lot more progress to make.
I'm still going to stay on this journey, and I'm on my way. I'm not there yet, but I'm pursuing that path. God wants us to enjoy the good things he's giving us to enjoy, but he doesn't want those things to control us. He wants us to find freedom. Here's how. Look at this, Galatians 5, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It says this, the, the, the way that the old Puritans used to teach, but they would talk about mortification of the flesh, which would have been an awesome 80s hairband. Mortification of the flesh. You know. But it is, it is really about taking the steps that you can take and doing the things that you can do so that you can gain mastery over the temptations that bring you down. The, the, the holiness writers, John Wesley, the Methodists, the, the, the holiness people, they would say this. It was, it was not just what you do. It's the power of a God living in you that gives you the ability to overcome. We have to take these steps because God says, I've got more for you than for you to get stuck in these same old patterns. So you have to take action. You have to get real. The first thing is this. Get real about gluttony. If this is an issue in your life, you have to own it. We cannot overcome sin that we will not admit to. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's some, there's some confession that needs to be done. You need to confess yourself. I have an issue. Stop looking past it. Stop underplaying it. Realize this is an issue. Again, maybe it's, maybe it's not excessive eating. Maybe for years it's the intake of food that you control. And that's what your focus has been. Admit there's an issue. You need to admit it to God. Why? Because we need, we need, we need God on our side. We need God on our, behind our back helping us with that. Admit to God what's going on. He knows, but there does something powerful when we can confess things and admit things to him. You need to confess to somebody else who can walk with you on this path. Confession is the path to power and freedom. The second thing is get real about your recovery. Take it seriously. Take real steps that make a difference. Listen to this from 1 Peter. So since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude that he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. Is this verse about the persecution of the church? Potentially. But this is really about us overcoming the sin that wages war against us in everyday life. He says, you won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you'll be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idols. So we have to come to this point. We have to come to this place where we have had enough. Enough. I'm going to take these steps. I'm going to take this seriously. The mortification of the flesh is a two-step process. Number one, God gives us the power to find freedom. This is what it says in Hebrews 4.16. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Mercy and grace are sometimes expressed in God giving us the power to overcome the obstacles that we are facing. It's not always God lifting us up and placing us over. Sometimes it's God saying, I am giving you the power to do what you need to do. Walk as if I am with you with the power that I have put in you to make a difference. He's telling us that we can do the things that he's called us to do. Not because of us, but because of him. In fact, I love this in Acts 1.8. It says it just like this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Can I tell you something? This power that we receive to, to go and spread the gospel, tell everybody about Jesus, it is, it is not only the power to speak. It is the power to live a life that looks different. It's the power to live a life that's actually free. It's the power to live a life that makes somebody go, I don't know what's going on with Jeff, but I want to live like him. It's the power to, 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 to live in the fullness of God's blessings. And that is something that we can only find as we pursue him. God gives us that power, but there's something we've got to do when he does. The second thing is this, as we walk in obedient pursuit of him. So God does this thing. God empowers us. What do we do? Look at what it says in John 13, 17. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. What do you know? God gives us the knowledge of his word so we can fight the lies of the enemy. 
But since we know these things, we've got to use that knowledge for that to work. God gives us the power in relationship with him. And since we know that there's power that comes from relationship with him, we have to make relationship with God a part of our daily practice so we don't just show up and wave at God every once in a while, so that we actually know him and walk in the power he provides. But not only that, this next one leads into the next, next point I'm going to make here too. We have to walk in relationship. We are not called to walk alone. We need to get relationships. That's, I try to make that alliteration work. It doesn't very well. <laughs> but the reality is this. You're stronger when you're with other people. You are stronger. You will run faster when you're running with someone else. You're going to be able to pull more weight when you have someone else in the harness with you. That's true. Life is better together. Life change happens in the context of relationships. Listen to what it says, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for who, the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's what he's saying. It's that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. These are the saints who have gone on before. This is the power of the presence of God that's in our life. But look around you now. You are surrounded in this place by a great cloud of witnesses, people who will cheer you on and walk with you and encourage you that when you want to stop, they'll say, no, come on, keep going. It's worth finishing this race. Don't stop too soon. You're surrounded by people who are willing to walk with you and help carry that burden with you. Don't take that for granted. God made us to be connected with him and with each other. And you will not find the freedom you need if you walk this walk alone. Can I tell you one of the things that I had to do, and, and the thing, one of the things I found most, most helpful is, is I got me some of these. Who knows what these are? Anybody know what these are? Yeah, we got a few people who know what these are. These are the chips that we hand out and celebrate recovery. This helped me find a path. It connected me with people to have support to make the achievements, to make the progress, to get the healing that I needed to overcome sugar addiction. I don't think I could have done this alone. It's been really powerful to have a wife who supports me. It's been really powerful to have friends who support me. It's been really powerful to have, have a kind of a plan and a path that, that helps me get where God wants me to go. I needed that. And can I tell you something? So do you. A lot of times people say, and they think about Celebrate Recovery, they think about just drug addiction. No, it's any hurt, habit, or hang up. It's a systematized sanctification process. If you're a believer, you could benefit from it. Guys, I believe that God is calling us to find freedom, to live in the full potential that he has. But I'm going to tell you where that starts. It starts in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And what I'm about to share is not new. It's not rocket science. But some of us need to start over. We need to repent of allowing any food or substance to fill in for Jesus. See, what I was doing was wrong. Turning to sugar, just like turning to heroin, it's wrong. One's legal, one's not. It's wrong. Some of us need to repent and not just say, God, forgive me, but just turn our back on that whole thing and walk away. We need to evaluate what's been driving the issue and ask God to help us heal and change. See, a lot of the reason why we stay stuck in things that we're stuck in is because we haven't dealt with the pain that caused it. We need to say, what's going on? What's going on inside me? What, what do I need to do to live the life that God is calling me to live? And, and then we need to ask for forgiveness. And this is so important, is forgive yourself. A lot of times it's the shame. Sometimes it's the, what's caused us is is. is is our shame because something's happened to us and we thought there was something we could have done to avoid it and we haven't forgiven ourselves for allowing something to happen that we had no control over to begin with. Wow, that can, that can get you stuck. But we need to ask for forgiveness from God. But we also need to forgive ourselves. And the last thing is this. We need to live the new life that God is calling us to. God created us to experience the abundance of life. And he's called us to live in it. 
not dream about it, not think, well, that's good for somebody else, but it's not good for me. God wants you to live in that life. And part of that living is getting up when you fall. Proverbs says that a righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up. And that's what living is. That's what living is about. It's about continually living and reorienting ourselves back to the Lord. This morning, if you want to make that decision, if you need to reorient your life, we're going to pray and give you a chance to do that. If you'll please stand with me, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, this is a tough topic. Lord, we want to minimize this issue, but it's, it's serious. And God, I pray right now that our hearts will be connected to you. God, I pray right now that we could lean deeply, deeply into the life that you're calling us to. God, I pray that you would heal our hurts and God, help us to find forgiveness. Lord, help us to be right with you. God, help us to seek you for the forgiveness of our sin. God, help us to embrace you for the life that you've called us to live. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all you're going to do. In your name we pray, Heavenly Father. Amen and amen. Grace and peace.